This one's gonna be fun. So those that know me know that I'm a pretty huge baseball fan. I've even got the poster with all the team logos on it. Heck, half the junk in this room is probably baseball related. Suffice to say that uh, when it comes to America's national pastime, you could say that I'm reasonably informed. That's why Rookie of the Year kinda hurts me to watch. It's not a horrible movie, it's just a misguided one. Very misguided. You know all the classic baseball movies, you know, like The Sandlot, or The Natural, or Field of Dreams, or Major League? Now, what made these movies good, apart from their compelling stories, was how all the baseball-related stuff was grounded in reality, how it felt authentic. That is not the case with Rookie of the Year. The story follows 12-year-old Henry Rowengartner, a clumsy, no-account baseball schlub who can't catch, can't throw, and just kinda sucks in general. Kinda like me at that age. All of a sudden, he suffers a horrific accident, causing him to break his arm in the most unrealistic way possible. Through some medical miracle, when his injury heals, he is magically able to launch a baseball 100 miles per hour. Because of this, he gets the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pitch for his favorite team, the Chicago Cubs. He must balance his superstardom with his friends, his mom, this older teammate, and this random girl that he likes, who is also barely in the movie. Sounds innocent, right? I watched this movie a lot when I was younger, and I enjoyed it well enough. For a cheesy, early 90s sports family movie, it does its job admirably. It stars Kevin from the American Pie movies in the title role. Which makes this movie super uncomfortable to rewatch. No longer will our penises remain flaccid and unused. We will fight for every man out there who isn't getting laid and should be. It was also directed by Daniel Stern, who is most famous for playing Marv in Home Alone. I think that was kind of an unspoken theme of this movie, because it's full of actors that aren't really that famous, but are at least known for one other role. Like this guy who played the dad in Clueless, uh, Mr. Duncan from Home Alone 2, uh, that guy from the middle, uh, this other guy from Apocalypse Now, and that one kid that was in Leprechaun. Very diverse group of folks. Oh yeah, and John Candy's also in it. He plays the Cubs' home announcer. He does not leave this booth. At all. For the entire movie. I guess it's to be expected that a movie like this has tons of questionable plot points. Mainly the explanation as to why Kevin, or Henry's, broken arm causes him to throw baseballs fast doesn't make any sense. The bone is fine, but the uh, tendons have fused with the humerus. <laughs> Is that bad? It's unusual. Huh? Henry's got the kind of best friends that even go to the doctor with him. But throughout the movie, they're not exactly the most supportive guys in the world. Nice catch, Henry. Yep, you're gonna get a lot of playing time. In fact, no one's really that nice to Henry. Hey, Rowan Gardner! Good game yesterday. <laughs> Nobody's really that nice to anyone else in this movie. Don't listen to him, Hank. He's a loser. You're not playing much of anything these days. That's going to make you stupid. I guess it already did. Everybody's so mean for no reason. Apart from the baseball side of things, there's a whole bunch of other uninteresting subplots, including Henry's mom and her idiot boyfriend. His friends plan to build their own boat. And how they get mad at him when his baseball career gets in the way of their playdates. Henry befriends this grizzled Cubs vet who serves as a sort of father figure and mentor for him. Made 100 times better by the fact that it's Gary Busey. This is the first movie I ever saw with Gary Busey in it, and I always found it kind of unsettling that he doesn't have this mustache in any of his other roles or in real life. Those gigantic teeth, though. Apart from these minor tidbits, I don't really have that much else to say about the actual plot of this movie. 
On its own, it's nothing special, and there's nothing wrong with that. Most kids' movies eventually fall into this as we get older. If this was the only issue I had with Rookie of the Year, then there wouldn't be much sense in making this video. Luckily for you, I have many other issues. Oh my goodness, this movie takes every liberty when it comes to the baseball side of things. I'm 90% convinced that the writers had never watched a baseball game before making this movie. And it's not even because it features a 12 year old playing in the MLB, somehow that isn't the most unrealistic part. Let me give you the tour. In the movie, the Cubs are absolute garbage and can't win a game to save their lives. Which was true for about 108 years, but for some reason, everyone in Chicago seems to hate them, and they struggle to attract any fans to their games, which was never true. The Cubs, through thick and thin, have always maintained one of the most loyal fan bases in any sport, which always seems to be the case with trash teams. Gary Busey's character, Chet Stedman, is made out to be this aging franchise star whose talent is quickly declining. But then we hear John Candy say this. Well, that's going to bring Rockets' earn run average to about uh, 300 or so, which equals the attendance here today. 300? Really? For those that may not be as familiar with baseball, having an earned run average of 300 is fantastic. It's definitely not the best of the best, but it's certainly good enough to make an all-star team, all things considered. We then get a scene of the owners talking about money troubles. We don't sell out every game for the rest of the season. We are going to uh, have to forfeit the franchise. Forfeit the franchise? What? Does this mean there's going to be no more Cubs? How did you even get yourselves in this predicament? After Henry's abilities are discovered, the Cubs manager visits him at his house, followed by this, um, quote-unquote tryout, where all he does is throw a couple balls. Right after that, Henry gets this highly publicized signing, plastered all over TV. So we are to assume that this 12-year-old kid, who's already shown that he's awful at baseball, immediately gets to play for a major league team, no contracts, no physicals, not even a stint in the minors. And that's huge, considering that upwards of 90% of all minor league baseball players will never set foot on an MLB field. Those guys have got to be kind of pissed. Now for Henry's debut. Unsurprisingly, he sh** the bed. Wow, it's almost like you let him join the team without actually seeing if he could play baseball. Through some circumstances even more miraculous than his broken arm shenanigans, the Cubs somehow scrape by with a win. Henry's second outing goes slightly better, despite annihilating this poor guy's spine with one of his HEATERS. The Cubs come away with another win, much to the surprise of John Candy. Hold on. Two? Isn't it August? This team literally wins the World Series at the end of the movie. How did they ever manage that when this is their longest winning streak? There are not enough games in a baseball season for this scenario to mathematically be able to work out. So after traveling to some more games via commercial airline... Come on, movie. Henry establishes himself as a superstar, evidenced by this slick montage of him striking out Bobby Bonilla. Pedro Guerrero, and Barry Bonds. So the Cubs are good now. Awesome. Time for a rockin' party. It's revealed that, much to no one's surprise, the sleazy general manager and the slimy stepdad are only in it for the money and plan to ship Henry off at the first opportunity. I've been talking to the Yankees. They want to buy the kid for 25 million dollars. But why? This is the worst trade deal in the history of trade deals, probably ever. The only reason you and your team aren't bankrupt is because of Henry. What's the point in getting rid of him so soon? I know 25 million dollars is a lot for one player, but in the grand scheme of an entire franchise's financial struggles, that's pretty much just a drop in the bucket. Not to mention that fans will probably stop coming if you get rid of Henry. Nothing good comes from this deal. 
This movie might just have the most illogical villains of all time. Now we get to see the real crushing reality of Henry's success. Commercials. Wow, it didn't take much at all for Henry to become a sellout. How long until we get overpriced Air Henry's? Anyway, in true 90s fashion, the ad is, of course, for Pepsi, and oh boy, is it painful. Ugh. Watching a commercial where a dumb 12-year-old's voice cracks with every other syllable would be really effective in getting me to choose Coke. I need you to be more... sexy. Hey, remember that whole Yankees thing? Well, it turns out that this dude gets Henry's mom to sign his rights away. Lickety split. No questions asked. She doesn't even look at what she's signing. You know, how smart people do. Well, we've gone a while without any conflicts. Let's have Henry's friends get mad at him for no good reason. Well, look who finally decided to show up. George, they kept me there for hours. You think I like doing that? I don't know, do you? He's a pro athlete now. Obviously, he's not going to have time to help you make your stupid boat. I'm guessing he's also a multi-millionaire, so just have him buy you an actual boat. They trade insults. They fight. And Henry gets all existentially worked up. Yay! Later, Chet gets the awful news that the organization plans to release him, even though by all metrics, he's still a great pitcher. You're going to sit out the rest of the season on the bench, and then we're releasing you. Greatest general manager award goes to... So Chet crushes Henry's spirits even more by telling him to cherish his gift while it lasts, because soon he'll get old and rusty and broken down, and he'll wither away and eventually get cancer and die. Oh, it's been less than five minutes since our last conflict? Let's add another one. Henry's been sold to the Yankees. They sold me? You can't do that. Of course I can. I'm the manager. I make the decisions. He is my son. He's my client. Oh my god, this overacting. By the way, there's no such thing as a personal manager. I mean, players have agents. Professional, highly paid agents. Which is weird that they chose Henry's mom's boyfriend, who is an inexperienced buffoon, to manage Henry's financial affairs. After throwing the scrub out of the house, Henry's mom finally decides to tell him the truth about his biological father, to which Henry responds, Mom, I know about Dad. What? I know that he left you when you were pregnant with me. Wow, you're a bit nonplussed, aren't you? This movie totally could have been a Tim McGraw origin story. Henry goes right back to kicking it with his friends, even though they just fought each other. They take their newly completed boat for a ride with their lady friends in tow, without a care in the world. Literally. Like, look at that exhaust. This has got to be the opposite of a hybrid, right? This scene alone is why we have global warming. Henry figures out that he enjoys being a kid more than playing pro baseball, so he goes to the owner's office and announces his retirement. I'm not going to be back next season. There's other things I want to do first. What a moron. Yeah, yeah, I know, childhood is sacrosanct and all, but there's friggin' bank to be made, my guy. What, you don't want to leave your dump of a house, buy an airplane, and put a bowling alley in your kitchen? Those were my dreams at 12 years old, at least. So in doing this, Henry has successfully doomed the Cubs to at least another decade of being terrible, since he's apparently been the only reason they've been winning lately. No, oh, I love the Cubs. And I love baseball. Whatever. So, as it turns out, the owner was never actually informed of the evil plot to sell Henry to the Yankees. God, that's an outdated term. And since no deals can be finalized without the consent of the team owner, this just puts a cherry on top of the villain's ineptitude. His plan really had no effect on the outcome of the movie, whatsoever. We've arrived at the most infuriating scene in the whole movie, the big game. Now, you might ask, well, is it the World Series? Is it the big one? No. This movie reaches its climax at the Division Championship Game. A game that does not exist in Major League Baseball. 
division championship. The loser goes home a loser. The winner moves on to the World Series. That's not how it works, movie. There's a divisional series, followed by a best of seven league championship series, then followed by a best of seven World Series. Why did the filmmakers choose to make this game the focal point of the entire film? At best, they have about six more games to go until the World Series starts. In direct opposition to the recent ownership decision, the manager chooses to put in Chet Stedman, even though he was presumably benched and is also very much injured and old. He performs admirably for a little while, but then, because he is very much injured and old, the choke job begins. Eventually, his arm blows out so bad that he can't even toss the ball to first base, prompting this Nimrod to make the worst base running error ever. Yeah, buddy! Let's ignore his obvious excruciating pain because go Cubs! Henry comes in to replace Stedman and quite literally turns the entire Mets lineup into his children. Kidding, Mac? You're 11 bucks short. They're three bucks a piece. Three dollars for a hot dog? Henry triumphantly runs out for the ninth until whoopsie. This looks familiar. Wow, I wonder if his magical pitching powers are gonna somehow disappear. Oh no. Looks like Henry's been reduced back to being a normie, so the team gets creative in how they're going to close out the game. That's definitely not allowed. Henry intentionally walks a second guy and then begins verbally assaulting him while he's at first base. Hey, I'm not chicken, cut it out! You know baseball players are always looking for a reason to start a fight, so it's a wonder that the benches haven't cleared yet. In the lamest way possible, Henry tricks this dude into trying to steal second and just tags him out, easy peasy lemon squeezy. So now there's two outs. Just when everything seems to be going great, in steps Dr. Doom. I'm your worst nightmare. <sighs> you guys seem awfully surprised to see him. Was he not playing this whole time? He's like the Mets biggest star and he's just getting in now? No wonder they end up losing. Somehow, some way, Henry manages to accrue two strikes on this roided out monster. Then we get this touching moment. Oh, come on. For basically the whole movie, and probably Henry's whole life, his mom has told him that his absentee father was this great baseball player, but with this epiphany, Henry finds out that it was his mom the whole time. What? I guess she played softball or something? Why would she lie to him about his dad? And how can they see each other from this distance? Floated. Floated. No, Henry, don't do it. That's the stupidest thing you could do. Don't- Oh, he's doing it. Huh. That worked? So Henry gets to live the life of a normal kid again. Or at least as normal as possible for an ex-pro athlete. He's playing regular baseball now, and Chet Stedman's the coach. And he's also probably porking Henry's mom. Life is good. The end. Wait. Is that a World Series ring? So they went to the World Series and we didn't get to see it? Why did the filmmakers not put the World Series in the movie? How did the team even manage to win without Chet or Henry? What a ripoff. So that was Rookie of the Year. And there's tons of stuff I didn't even get into, like how the manager pronounces Henry's name differently every time. Henry Ruhlenfurter. Rosenbagger! 
Garden hoser! Or how the umpires are way too over the top. <laughs> or Daniel Stern's obnoxious character. <laughs> or George and Clark's creepy female objectification. Not that hot. She's stacked. Just look at her sipping that milk. Milk's done that body good. <laughs> Or how his friends are literally named George and Clark. <laughs> Again, not a terrible movie. Just one that should have done some more baseball homework beforehand. I like to think of Rookie of the Year as a kind of spiritual prequel to American Pie, where Kevin's failed baseball career leaves him with an inferiority complex and an inability to express his true feelings to his girlfriend. Which I guess means that this girl eventually becomes Tara Reed. Now you can watch this movie and know that good old innocent Henry gets naked on camera in just six short years. I also feel that this movie could definitely be a part of the Home Alone cinematic universe. Considering how many of the same people are in both. And considering how Henry also lives in the all-white part of Chicago that the McAllisters do. These two definitely know each other. That's it. If you want to see some more of my videos, I invite you to click right up there. And if you enjoyed this one, please smash that subscribe button. Help a brother out.